Hey guys, what's up? I got a special guest for you guys today. John Briggs from Insight Tax, but you probably know him for his book, Profit First for Gyms. This one's actually kind of important to me as you'll hear when you uh, check out this episode, but um, I make a lot of financial mistakes. I've learned talking to John. Actually, I've, I've known it all along, but he's just really exposed it for me. Um, I am not the best with my money. I'm not the best um, in general with being on top of stuff like, like John wants. And I think if any of you guys are like me and you've got these like $5 recurring charges that just hang around for 10 years, this is one you're gonna wanna listen to. Um, John kind of goes over the concepts of profit first, how he actually gives you kind of the framework for how you can do it yourself if you want to. Of course, I recommend you probably buy his book or check out his stuff online to figure out um, how to actually dial this in and do it right. But you know what? Any starting point is better than no starting point. So if you feel like you've got some financial problems or you're maybe one big crazy event away from being underwater at your gym, um, check this episode out because John's gonna give you some really good tips. All right, I'll catch you on the other side. Uh, welcome everybody. Another episode of the Gym OS podcast. This is Dan Waymer, CEO of Push Press here. Um, today, we got a pretty special um, guest for you guys. Um, a lot of you might have trouble managing your money on a month to month basis. A lot of you guys might be um, one month away from maybe even going out of business. If so, I can tell you uh, from experience, you're not alone. And uh, the guest we have on today can probably tell you from experience you're not alone too. He's helped a ton of gyms fix their financial system, or it's not system, their financial situation. Today we got John Briggs. John is from Insight Tax. He's the author of Profit First for Micro Gyms. And um, generally good guy, owns a gym in the community, and he's been working hard to try and help other gym owners correct and fix some of the approaches that they have to money to try and shore up some of these financial situations they have. Um, so without further ado, let me let John introduce himself real quick. Tell us a little bit about himself. Hey, yeah, Dan, thanks for having me on here. Um, so I'm a CPA by education and I have a firm. I've owned this firm for more than 10 years now. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, I decided, you know, we've been having fun serving the gym owners. Why don't I become one as well? So I bought into the gym that I work out at because it was failing and thought it'd be a good experience to figure out if I could also help a gym turn over uh, a new leaf from the ownership side, not just from a financial planning side. Um, but we, we have a great team here. There's 20 of us. And, um, you know, we're just, we think the world is a better place the more gym owners that there are. The more, the more assistance they can provide to people, the better the world is in general. If you think about the benefits of health and what that does for our economy, for people's take home pay, for what they're able to do, how long they can live. So we're super stoked about being able to serve the gym industry and you know we want to keep them in business as long as possible yeah i think that's awesome you guys have that viewpoint that's exactly how we feel here in fact um as you were talking i was kind of thinking like one thing that's cool about the crossfit community it's almost like the church community in that like you're you're a cpa i'm an ex-developer like there are people from the professional realms that have found their way into into fitness and and these communities that are happening in these micro gyms and they love it so much that they're bringing their professional skill into the arena, right? I see that kind of like churches probably do the same thing too, the community. I, I think that's a pretty cool thing that you're able to bring the financial planning aspect um, into the arena here. Real quick, before we begin, I see a sign in the background that says CK the IRS. What, <laughs> what is going on with that? Can you pull that into frame? Yeah, it's actually a board game. Stick the IRS. Did you do that on purpose? I did. Oh. <laughs> pretty clever it's a real board game it's kind of uh it's modeled after monopoly but yeah okay well you got it's me with fun. that because i had to know what it said <laughs> that's cool um damn i had a question to ask you around that church thing too and i forgot it because i got so distracted by stick the irs but um let's dive into what it's like to be a gym owner that's struggling because you you're probably one of the few gym owners that I know that actually inserted yourself right into the point of struggling. Like most, most of us, like we started a gym and then we realized there's some stuff we got to fix. You're just like, hell man, this one's really in bad shape. I'm going right in. 
So why don't you tell us like what it was like those first moments where you took over the gym that you already knew was in trouble. What was that like? You know, and it's funny, the word moment itself, um, I would say it, were, it was months, it was many months, but yeah, certainly in hindsight, I think it'd be, it would have been easier to create a profitable gym from scratch. Um, but yeah, you jump in and the, you're just looking at these numbers and you're looking at the commitments that were made by previous owners and you're like, wow, they, for example, they had way too much square footage for the number of members that they had. They went, they did a classic mistake. They had, cause I was at the gym when we were at this, a smaller location, 2000 square feet. And they had maybe one class that was at capacity. So automatically, of course, that means we should jump into a bigger space. Oh, let's go from 2000 square feet to 7,000 square feet. Well, yeah, we can handle that. We'll just, the members will come cause it's a bigger space. We'll get more. Well, that didn't happen. And uh, anyway, so we're stuck with this rent obligation um, that's tied to the business with not a lot of members. We had a scenario where owners, the previous owners did nothing to actually create a vision or a culture. So it's kind of like each coach being able to do whatever they wanted when they showed up to coach their classes. Some of those became pretty entitled. And we used some passive aggressive techniques to get them out, like putting them on probation, taking away classes until to see if they could improve or, you know, they chose yeah. to quit. Um, but I can tell you it, it's, it's stressful because as I mentioned, I, health is a huge benefit for everybody and fitness is a big part of that. And so we had this community that I was a part of. I enjoyed my workout routine. Um, the location's great for where I work and live. But it's like, man, now this, there's this additional stress. What do we do so that these people can keep this habit going in their own lives? Um, but yeah, it, you almost don't even know where to start sometimes when you look at it. So we, we just started with revenue compared to expenses. We don't have enough. Great. So that means we need to focus on sales. Uh, okay, let's look at our expenses though. And we, we just, we hatcheted it through it, man. Like surgical, I would say. So let me ask you this. So if, if there's a gym owner out there right now who's listening to this and, and like those, there's only so many levers you can pull to become profitable, right? Uh, you know, make more money, spend less money are basically the two easiest ones for a gym owner. Um, yeah. If they're in that boat right now, what do you think that they should a attack first? Or is it both in tandem? For most gyms that we come across that are struggling, they have enough revenue. And it just comes down to being more conscious and controlled and decisive about their expenses. Um, Cause what happens is sometimes when things are good, our expenses will increase with the good increase, but then if it drops a little bit, expenses don't drop at the same pace. And so we just, we've added, you know, financial fat onto our gym uh, and it's harder to get rid of it. So a lot of times it's as simple as going through the expenses and identifying, you know what, these aren't really good expenses. So I, I teach it this way. Um, a lot of times if people have spoken to their accountants about their expenses, the accountant comes back and says, is it variable or is it a fixed expense? Mm -hmm. Which is accounting jargon. And I give gym owners permission to not care at all what those two words mean, because I don't think understanding if your expenses are variable or fixed helps you make better business decisions. I think the two criteria should be, is this productive for my gym or is this not productive for my gym? And I know it sounds really simple, but gym owners aren't taking the time to actually ask those questions. What do I get out of spending this money? And if they're honest with themselves, they'll realize there's a lot of expenses that they could cut back and still provide a great service to their members and allow them to be profitable, which then therefore allows them to stay open for as long as they want. Right. And I guess in order to even get to that point where you're looking at expenses and, and um, deciding if it's productive or not, I feel like I know quite a bit of gym owners who don't even look at their chart of accounts, maybe don't even know what their chart of accounts are, right? Like, what would you suggest if, if somebody right now is like, okay, great, I'm looking at my expenses, where are my expenses? Like, what, what would you suggest that they do? Yeah, uh, yeah that's a great observation. Um, their bank account is where I would recommend they start. Okay. Print off. And 
I wouldn't even look at, I'm going to look at the last 12 months. Let's start small. Give yourself a little victory, right? Just like when a new member comes in, you want to give them some sort of small victory the very first workout. It's, it's no different with our financial habits. So look at last month's bank statement. That's it. And look at your expense items. And you might even realize, I don't even know what this expense was for. That's probably a good sign that you don't need that expense. Yeah. That, uh, we, so we actually do that here at Push Press. Uh, my partner, Brian, does that. And it's always like, I know it's the first, like it just happened yesterday. The, the, towards the first of the month, I'm like, what is this expense and what is it for? What is this expense and what is it for? I'm like, great, Brian's doing this again. But it's good because we just found that we had paid two months for some service that we didn't even know. I think we got, like someone took our card. Or it was like something in the medical field or something, something totally random. Um, yeah, it's a good idea. So like um, one thing that I would do when I owned a gym is I would print out that bank statement and I had like a bunch of different highlighters and I would go like yellow, green, like I would highlight them. I had a color coding system. And that way I can kind of scan it and see like if I'm seeing a lot of, I had a red, like a pinky red one for the ones that are like, I probably should get rid of this. And then if I saw a lot of that, I'm like, okay, I need to devote because time's of issue, an issue. And if I looked at my thing and I had like one or two, I'd be like, ah, whatever, you know, maybe I should deal with it. But I was like, not worth my time for this, you know, these $12 charges or whatever. But I saw a bunch. I'm like, okay, this month I'm sitting down and fixing all of these red things. So if you feel like you're kind of strapped for time or you need a system, I, I, I need systems. So that's kind of, that could be one way to do it. I'm sure there's, other yeah, I think it's a very it. simple approach that any gym owner is capable of doing. So that's a great starting point. Yeah. I think that's a good topic too, about getting a little win. I mean, it's in, in your gym, it's so obvious. Like when someone comes in, you're just like, Hey man, like, let's not try and lose 40 pounds today. Let's just like, <laughs> let's just get in and have a good time and just enjoy fitness for, for the first step. Um, but then when we apply that stuff to our own lives, we're just like, I want to, I want to become profitable tomorrow. Right. Like, and you've spent four years screwing up your book. So like, you've got to take the little wins. I think that's a great piece of advice. Cool. Um, so when you're looking through these, I'm going to call them buckets of expenses and, and kind of like looking through this stuff, we're going to flip back to this chart of accounts mode, I guess. Um, what do you see in your clients are the biggest offenders of like things where they're, they're bloated out of proportion that, that can easily be trimmed back? Like just classifications of expenses, I guess. Um, dues and one? subscriptions. Uh, you were just talking about that $12 expense, mm -hmm. right? Um, those $12 expenses add up. And if you're not paying attention to them, you don't even realize that you're paying for them because you're not using it. You know, are, are, do you have some sort of service that maybe you're paying for all the bells and whistles, but they have a low, less expensive version of what you're actually using? Um, or music services. So many gyms have multiple music uh, subscriptions. Like I get it's only 10 to 15 bucks a month, but that crap adds up. And with the margins that you have as a gym owner, especially if you're not profitable, you've got to take the time to get rid of that first. Um, they, I mean... Those are the most common ones that we see where people are like, oh, I, yeah, I was paying for two or three. Um, when, when I joined the gym, there kept being this like $5 charge. And every month I asked the other business partner, I'm like, what the hell is this expense? Yeah. He finally like found out it was from a previous domain service they were using <laughs> for their URL. He's like, we haven't used that for a year and a half, but this company just kept charging them, charging them. In other scenarios, I know a gym owner out in uh, North Carolina where he bought one of those like bulldog machines, uh, like you, the floor cleaning machine, and he had a lease to own. Well, their contract stipulated, we will keep charging you regardless of how much you've paid us until you cancel the payment. Even if you've owned, even if you've come to own it? Even if you've come to own it. Oh my Lord. It was in the contract. And because he wasn't looking at his numbers the way he should have, we're talking like, <laughs> I, I swear like, like $4,000 he overpaid. That's almost predatory because who A, like understands that language in the contract and B is like, okay, five years from now in June of 2025, this contract should be over. So I'm going to remember. There's no doubt that there's an ethical problem with that company who sold him that and did that type of agreement. Is, is but that at the same time, itself or is that a reseller? No, it was a, yeah, I was some okay. reseller. I love, Bull, uh, I love my bulldog machine. I was like hoping it wasn't them. I'm yeah, no, not, not the company itself. Okay. 
But at the same time too, you can't shirk from taking the accountability of like, yeah, I should have been looking at my numbers and realized, wait a minute, why am I, why do I keep seeing this monthly lease payment? Right. Hey, that actually brings me to a, um, a very pertinent uh, question that I have because my gym might be going through it soon or went through it. So we negotiated when we got our lease that like um, we would get, you know, uh, deposits back on certain times or like certain kickbacks vested over time. Like they gave us like TI kickbacks, not on the first date, but like every six months we get some. I'm pretty sure we forgot about that and paid the full amount of rent. Like when those TI kick, I have to go check. <laughs> do you have a system that you, I'm not the best at this either guys. That's what I'm talking about. But is, do you have a system in like, other than just, I mean, the obvious writing it on a calendar, like what the hell should I have done to make sure that when that six months, cause I mean, they're kind of written. So it's like eight, it wasn't six months. It was like 18 months and 36 months or something like that. Right. Yeah. Like how do you, and same with this bulldog thing. Like how do you expect people to remember that? Or what is your, what is your system for that? If you you don't, but like you actually said it, I literally would go into my calendar 18 months from now and put a task or like a block out of block saying your rent payment is going to should decrease based on this. It, yeah. It's the simplest way. Like everyone had, well, I shouldn't say everyone, you should have a calendar if you're a gym owner, <laughs> like a big one on the wall, a big, big one on the wall or just a Google calendar, which is free. Mm. Um, I, I would do it on my Google calendar. That's smart. you could, put a note in your cell phone. You can just set a note for yourself to populate on that date, but whatever system you need to remind yourself, that's what I would do. Right. Just, I guess the point is to make sure to do it immediately and not immediately. Assume. Yep. The second you have it set up. So um, something I want to kind of dive into that you brought up that I'm the biggest offender of, like, I actually need your help personally. I'm, my finances are not the greatest, um, but all of these $5, $12, $15 charges that add up, um, I would be the first to be like, ah, it's not worth my time for five bucks, right? But as you were saying it, I realized like, it's actually super important to dial in those $5 charges because you're actually training yourself to have the state of mind of being financially responsible, right? Like, do you think, am I alone here or is this a common th thread of people nowadays? It's, I think it's a common thread, especially if you're not dying, like bleeding profusely as a gym from a financial standpoint it's easy to just say, look, my time's worth more than that. It's $60 a year, whatever. Like I'll eventually get to it or something. But I mean, think about, there used to be more of a kick in the CrossFit community where people would get infuriated when members would cheat reps during the workout. And it's, well, they're only cheating themselves. Yeah, but someone else is competing against them and they're going to get mad at each other. But that's effectively what you're doing is you're, you're admitting that you're cheating reps, which we know in the long run is not a good habit to have in your workouts because yeah. then every time you feel slightly exhausted, you're going to go ahead and give in to the exhaustion instead of pushing through and, you know, getting a better result out of the workout. It's, it's no different when I look at $5 and say to myself, you know what, if I tolerate that $5, where else is this toleration showing up in my life? And it could be showing up in areas that have more zeros attached to the number. Absolutely. Yeah. If I had a, a dollar for every time I said it's not worth my time, I wouldn't be in a bad financial spot, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So let's talk about Profit First as a system. So that Profit First is a book that isn't particularly pointing towards Jim's fitness or anything like that. Right. And that's more of a mindset, uh, a framework of uh, financial management. Correct. Yeah, totally. So we have Profit First, the generic system, um, which is why I wrote Profit First for micro gym specifically, so that it at least talks to the gym owner. Uh, but it is, it's a framework, absolutely designed, like it's structured to be designed for the needs of each individual owner. And there are some factors that just make sense for everybody, but then there's other things that people need to tweak um, that work best for the way their cash flow works and their different things they got going on. Yeah. I mean, like every framework, you can't just wholeheartedly subscribe to a framework without taking uh, your own personal circumstances into account. So right. why don't you give us the top down layman's version of profit first and, and why it's effective? Well, I, I mean, the first one is just the gym owners work or they, like, they live paycheck to paycheck despite working a heroic amount of hours. 
And so this system helps them really make the time they're sacrificing with all those hours they're putting in. So they don't have to stress about the paycheck to paycheck thing from a overview standpoint. It's really the idea of spending your money bef like on paper before you actually spend it in real life. Um, the challenge is, is as humans, we have, there's this law that this guy developed called part, which I shouldn't say developed that he coined called Parkinson's law, which says that the supply will always um, increase to meet the demand. Uh, and the way this works with business owners is that they have one bank account and their expenses are always going to increase to the extent they have money available to spend. And so we just say, hey, how about this? Why don't we set up some additional bank accounts for the big expenses that we know you're going to have or should have, like owner's pay, paying yourself. That is the most important expense that the gym can have for you as a gym owner. Set up a separate account for it. So when income comes in and it gets deposited, let's take a portion out and put it in the owner's pay account. Let's take a portion out and save some for taxes. Let's take a portion out and set a little bit aside for the equipment replacement that we know is gonna to have to happen at some point down the road. Now all of a sudden, when I look at my operating expense account, I have less money in there because I've already spent it in other places with other commitments I've already made. And now Parkinson's law has a much, uh, it's, it's a dip, more difficult time for it to kind of screw us over mm -hmm. because I can just look at the now expense. I can clearly see now how much I actually have available for operating expenses because I've set aside the money already for the other commitments. Right. I assume probably in your book or through, through some of the workbooks that you have available, you kind of lay out all the different buckets of these like pre revenue spend categories that people need to pay attention to. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So, I mean, that's good. So if they, if they, if people can find that, then they can start looking at the things that they need to spend before they spend, spend on paper before they spend in real life. Um, do you recommend one bank account or multiple bank accounts? Multiple bank accounts. Okay. Hold on one second. It's asking me to pay. It's going to cut off. Okay, Ashley, we're going to cut that out. We got 10 minutes going to cut out, cut off. So we can keep going and then just reconnect. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So you recommend people have multiple bank accounts. Like, like are those bucketed in a certain way? Like this is for owners and this is for expenses of the gym or how do you, how do you structure Yeah. So that? we call them the essential seven. Uh, we recommend seven bank accounts. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm hearing. Yeah. Um, an income account for all deposits to come into and that's its only purpose. Uh, owners pay profit to distribute to you as an owner for the risk of being an owner taxes uh, equipment and uh, let's see, where am I missing the other operating expense, of course. And I'm missing an obvious one. Owners pay profit, tax, equipment. I, I forgot the other seven. That's uh, what about coaches pay or is that? Coming? Yeah. Team member expense. That's okay. the one. Yeah. Wow. Thanks. I got it. Yes. I feel like family feud. <laughs> Okay, cool. So you're getting seven bank accounts and you're, you're funneling income comes into one and then you're kind of spreading out. Does the income also become your op operational expense account? No, we or recommend your... keeping them separate. Okay. So does the income income, does the income bucket get zeroed out every month? Or every, you... we actually suggest you sit down either once a week or twice a month, but every time you sit down, it gets zeroed out. You're saying zero out that income. Account. Income. That's right. So this is very interesting to me because now it's basically like your books almost become your accounting and that you, you take, you take everything from here, you distribute it across these accounts. This one ends up at zero. And then the one account that you kind of get to discretionally spend from probably works its way down to zero. And then you just start all over again next month when the income comes in. Hey, yes. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Finish. So it, it's actually a great way to not have to budget because you're setting aside the money mm -hmm. to the main buckets, you know, they need to go to. Um, Cause most people are really terrible at budgeting anyways. And this way, you're covering all your bases, um, all the important things that the gym's going to have. And it also forces you to see, because especially in the beginning, you're going to pay yourself a certain amount and you're going to transfer that into the owner's pay account. Then you're going to compare what's left <laughs> in mm -hmm. 
in your operating expense account to the bills you actually have. And a lot of times you have more bills to pay than you can afford to pay. What do you do then? That forces you to actually ask those questions. Is this at a productive expense or this is, is this not a productive expense? <clears throat> and I'm obviously going to pay the ones that are most critical first to keep the doors open and the service going. And I might find that I'm consistently pushing off certain bills that tells me I need to cancel that service. Yes, pay the bill eventually, but you don't need it because you've already told yourself this isn't critical to my operations. Right. Yeah. For the, for those gym owners who start doing this process and get to the end of it all and realize like, I just, I paid all the bills. I still have some more bills that are like lights are going off or coaches aren't showing up if I don't pay it. Um, what do you do then? You, 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 do, is there like an order of precedence that you're dipping out of the, like the profit first pay first type accounts? Yeah. So um, the tax account will be the first one I take out of. Be, and here's why. Not because like you want to have money set aside to pay taxes, but if you're doing this system and you don't have enough left over, you probably don't have a profit that you're going to pay tax on in the first place. Um, so that's why I say out of the tax account first. The next one would be equipment because it's not an immediate emergency. Um, those are the first two. Then profit would be the one after that, owner's pay being the last one. But we okay. think it's more important that the owner pay themselves regularly, which is what the owner's pay accounts for, than being able to give themselves a quarterly profit distribution when in the beginning, there's probably not a profit to distribute in the first place. And, and I'm going to guess that it's the same thing. You want to put yourself in the mindset of getting in the habit of paying yourself. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and I'm assuming also in this book, um, I, I haven't read it. I have a, a backlog of books I need to read. This is on my shelf. Um, probably need to push this one forward after all these admissions I've made. But I'm assuming in this book, they, you, you have percentages or some type of ratios where the money is going different places. That's yeah, we have a table. Mm -hmm. Okay. We won't give away the secret sauce here. Um, cool. So how many gyms are using, are, are you helping right now? Uh, we have a little more than 300 clients that are gym owners. That's awesome. And, and that, is that like a bookkeeping client? Like you're working with them regularly or is that more like you're consulting them how to become their own profit first guru type thing? Yeah. All of the above combination, tax consulting, bookkeeping services, profit first coaching. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, cool. Um, so let's talk, let's, let's actually dive into that tax thing that you mentioned before, because this is an ongoing question I always, I always have, or a debate I have with people. Um, I'd like to know your take on getting a refund during tax season. Yeah. So I think it's important that we understand if we get a refund during tax season, that means you gave a loan to the government and they're not paying you interest on it. That's all a refund represents. Now, Sometimes the refund is a component of credits that are earned, which means you didn't pay money in and you just get money back. Great. We'll take that all day long. But if you paid money in during the year and you end up getting a ton back, you're giving, your, you're giving the government interest-free loan. And I can tell you, they're not appreciative of your willingness to do that. They're not benefiting fitting your life because you're so generous in doing that. Yeah. So it's always better in our mind to strategically plan, um, look, do tax estimates, figure it out. It's one of the reasons why the profit first system works so well is because you're setting aside money in your tax account, but you're not necessarily always sending that money every time to the government. So you can rely on that balance and use it if you needed to for other emergencies. Plus then when the tax bill comes, you now have the exact amount that you need to pay and a lot of times they end up over saving and they can then use that. So it's like, I didn't give you, the, you, you it's like you get refund. a refund with exactly, you issue yourself your, your own refund. Yeah. And I think, I think the, the concept of what you're saying is really important. I get in this argument with a lot of people because people always assume the bigger the refund, the better. And, and I also understand that like, there's some people that if you don't get a refund, you might be really hurting yourself at the end because you didn't plan for it. But I think the, the key thing is, like you're saying, is you're going to be accumulating some money in an account over time because you're going to have to make some quarterly payments to the government for your taxes. But you, you might be saving more than your quarterly or at worst case, you're going to have like up to a quarter's worth of money in there. And if something 
Like if something, if an emergency happens in your life, the government's not going to give you your money back so you can handle a medical bill, right? But if you're accumulating this bank account and you can't send it to them, you're going to owe them some interest. You know, it's, it's, it's not gonna be the end of the world. It happens all the time to the IRS, but you have the money and the, you have the money to deal with what you have to deal with. And I think that's, what's important because I see a lot of people, not just gym owners, gym owners, specifically a lot of people in general, um, who are basically one life event away from like cat catastrophe, catastrophe financially, right? Like one accident they didn't expect one, you know, um, natural disaster in their gym. They didn't expect. And it's just game over. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. Cool. So, I mean, if, if you're listening to this and, and you feel like that's you, these are the reasons why we want you to pay attention to people like John, because they're going it, to, it's going to take time. It's just like any client you bring into the gym, but you're going to start getting your stuff in order to the point where you do have a rainy day fund. Um, like this, this is super topical. And, and by the time people listen to this, it might be completely over, but in, you know, coronavirus, there's gyms in Italy that have been shut down for two weeks. Like the government won't let them open. And I don't know how that would impact some gyms if your gym had to shut down for two weeks and all your members asked for two weeks of their membership back, right? Could happen. I mean, it could happen in the next coming weeks even here. So, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, outside of all that, um, what is a simple tax tip that you would, you would throw out there for a gym owner to maybe be able to deploy to help, help themselves save some money or um, put themselves in a better position? Yeah. So our favorite go-to, uh, some people call it the Augusta rule. Others call it corporate rent. Uh, it's referred to as the Augusta rule on the East coast because every year, uh, there's a really big golf tournament out in Augusta, Georgia called the masters. And Augusta is not a very big city, but during the masters, it triples in population. And there's literally just, it's not a good investment for someone to own a hotel out there because they'd only have occupancy for like <laughs> two to three weeks out of the year. So what happens is um, a bunch of these people open their homes and they rent them out and they get paid an exorbitant amount of money. Well, I, I don't know the actual history of how this law got into place, but my guess is some rich person in Augusta uh, pushed this through to a lobbyist and there, they created this tax rule in the tax code. And it says, if you have a property and you rent it out for less than 14 days during the year, you are not required to claim the income you make off of renting that property. So basically it says, if you have a property and it's more than 14 days, that's a rental property based on tax code. Less than that, it's nothing. So these people can rent their homes out for these two weeks during the masters uh, and not have to claim the income. Well, that's pretty cool. How, does, how can we get that to benefit a gym owner? Well, companies have board meetings and big companies spend money, lots of money, renting out hotels and convention centers and venues to have a company meeting. Well, you're a company, doesn't matter that you're one employee or two employees, you're still a company based on the tax rules. So your company can rent your living space from you as a venue to hold its monthly corporate meeting. Because you're renting it out once a month, that's 12 times during the year, which fits into this tax rule I just explained. So any income you make off of that personally, you are not required to claim that as income on your tax return. Is this Augusta rule a nationwide thing or is that? Yeah. They just call it the Augusta rule because people in Augusta do it. Oh, wow. So if a company can rent out or any, any entity can rent out something, a property for a uh -huh. minimum, maximum 14 days. Yeah. So in this case, we're looking at it from the angle of you own your living space. Um, you can rent out your living space. Oh, the person, uh, not the company. To the, the person, the company is taking an expense mm -hmm. because that's what the tax code calls ordinary and necessary, which is they, it actually doesn't make any sense. So they created definitions to further explain ordinary and necessary, which also, also don't make sense, but basically other businesses do this so you can do it. <laughs> okay. Fair the enough. company, the company pays a rent expense, which reduces your taxable income 
but it's paying the rental expense to you, but you don't have to claim it as rental income. Okay. So I'm going to follow up with a question that I know I'm going to prevent a bunch of gym owners from really hurting themselves. What is the limit? Like you can't say it costs my monthly mortgage, <laughs> to, right? You do, you, nest, you definitely need to do a market rate. We typically recommend going to Airbnb or Verbo, as they say now on their marketing, and just uh, search for properties similar to yours in your area and see what they're going for, for a day use. Um, you could also contact a hotel and get a bid from them. In general, what we have found is $1,250 $1, is a pretty safe average for most people in the United States. But I have clients in New York and they can do $3,000. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's, if you're in a really high rent area. But it's got, for sure, it has to be market rate because if you are audited and it's exorbitant and doesn't match market rate, you have now invited the ire of the IRS onto you and you don't want that. Yeah. I mean, I guarantee there were some enterprising gym owners right now thinking just like me, like, cool, I'm going to charge my monthly mortgage for $10,000. <laughs> and everything will just go away. No. Yeah. Okay, cool. That, that's, um, this is why I think you need, everyone needs to pay a tax guy personally, because who knew that out there? I didn't know that. Um, well, I can tell you too, when some of these people go to their actual accountant and they say, hey, I heard this on a podcast. If the accountant's not aware of the tax code, they're going to be like, you can't do that. Because they're going to be thinking of a different tax rule that basically talks about you can only take expenses to the extent of your income and the hobby anyways. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's really important to have a good tax person. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, the tax laws in America are very beneficial to business owners. And I think for good reason, because business owners create jobs and stimulate the economy and all these things. So if you are kind of just like running through your business and just plowing your, all your business numbers into Quicken or something, you, you might, I, I'm, I'm not licensed to give tax advice, John is, but you might be overpaying and you might not be, t be able to take advantage of like a lot of these little things that you, you shouldn't know unless you're, you're it's what you do. I, I would hope you didn't know that. Um, but you hire someone like John who does, and then you save a ton of money, right? That's just how it works. All right, let's rapid fire through a couple things. Um, getting to the, towards the end of this episode, what is your favorite podcast right now, other than mine? Other than yours, of course. <laughs> um, oh gosh, I listen to quite a few, but uh, there's one with, his name's Dan Sullivan. Uh, it's, it's like a technology one. And that's how good I am with things. I don't even know their freaking names. I'm kind of the same way. I listen to so many podcasts. I get them mixed up. I get the titles confused. I get the authors confused. E Exponential Wisdom. Oh, that sounds good. Okay. They, they're really good. He, he, this, they always discover, they're talking about new technologies and how it's changing the world. And I, I just find it fascinating every time. Yeah, I think that's a good thing to, to dial into. Um, do you have a mentor? I do have a few mentors. Um, I'm currently working with a company, the Kelly Roach team is how they call themselves. Um, that's mainly on the insight tax side. And then we have two brain as our business mentors for the oh, gym okay. side. Oh, for the gym side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I just did a podcast with Chris and that was a uh, really fun. Chris is, Chris is a great guy. He's super smart. Um, okay. So I'm going to tee that one up. Do you feel like people out there listening right now should have a mentor if they don't? I absolutely think you need a mentor. Um, and here's why you are the, as the owner, you're the least competent person in your business structure. And here's why, because wherever you're currently at, you've never had a business at that size before. So how do you know how to run it? So like when we first hit, we crossed the million point at insight tax. I had no idea how to run a million dollar business. And now I don't know how to run a multi-million dollar business. I need a mentor to help me see what I'm not seeing. Yeah. You also go through moments of second guessing yourself and you need someone to basically give you the confidence when you need that and to, or to give you the direction when you need it. Yeah. I just, I think as an owner, you, you need mentors in your life for sure. Yeah. I say that all the time to people like I am further along in this business than I've ever been. And I think, I think for some people out there, that's a hard thing to admit. 
to be able to look at yourself and, and be like, well, I just took another step into the, into the forest and I, I'm one step deeper and I don't know where I am. That's it. Sometimes it's hard for me to say it and weird to say it, but it's the truth. Um, I do think hopefully if you're running your gym, you you're farthest, farther along than you've ever been. Cause if you're not, that means you're kind of going backwards. But um, if you, if you are, and you feel that way, it's like, I think it's something to be proud of, not ashamed of. And, and your ego shouldn't get in the way of talking about that because all the best people who have done all the best things have somebody in front of them helping them save time and save them from making mistakes. Yeah. I don't think anyone should be ashamed of that. It's just a reality as the owners, we're the least competent. My team members know what to do because they, I'm, they do the same thing. It's just more of it. Yeah. But you know, we I've never had this many members before. I've never had to deal with a poisonous coach, you know? Yeah. And if you really, really want to dive deep into like running a business and being a leader, you should be trying to build a business where you aren't the best coach anymore and you're not the best front desk person or the best sales person. Like you are, you aren't, you're the best leader. You're the best person putting all the butts in the seats and getting the, the bus driving the right way. But if you're still looking at your gym and being like, I'm the best coach, I'm also the best salesperson, I'm the best janitor, then, then the gym is struggling for that, right? So yeah. One of you. Um, that actually leads me to a, to a really exciting one that I want to ask you and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hope that this works because it might not have you are you watching or have you watched the show narcos mexico i haven't damn it didn't work okay i'm like obsessed with this show right now and it's basically it's basically you know about the drug trade in mexico and this guy who took it from an idea to 15 billion dollars a year and i'm watching it like oh he's a ceo and he's making the he shouldn't he he like literally his biggest mistake in the show is he's the most important employee for every section and that's why it all eventually has problems because he doesn't have the leadership to put people in place to handle all these things for him. Um, and it's just, I just think it's funny. Like I'm watching this and I'm like, uh, learn, trying to learn for push press. And I'm, and now that we're talking about it, I'm like, yeah, if a gym owner is also, you know, the best mule, then problem. <laughs> no, but you bring up a good point. So I think a lot of times there's three things that we misunderstand as, as owners in general is the difference between the word delegation abdication and decision making a lot of times when we delegate we're actually we ended up abdicating the responsibility and we don't have them bring accountability back to us we just hope things get done then when we take a step up we're like oh wait that's not good now instead we have people coming to us we make the decisions for them and then they go out and do the work but the reality is if you want to own a business you need to delegate the responsibility. They need to feel responsible and accountable mm -hmm. to you uh, in order for you to really probably meet the vision that you have for your gym. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's, it's a scale thing. Like if you really want to take your gym to the next level, you can't be making every decision for every person. You have to be training people to the point where you can trust that they're making the right decisions and have them tell you. And then maybe you guys talk through it and help them, you know, help them. My thing is like, I want to help you find, you find the better decision not me tell you what the decision is i still have a yeah. problem with that myself honestly it's, it's tough it's hard it, it's really hard i'm st yeah. i still struggle with it totally yeah. so actually that's a good takeaway for me from this this because uh i never thought i never realized there was three i thought there was two like either i'm telling you or um i'm, I'm giving you the power to do it um, but yeah that's a big thing with me is trying to get people to help um all right cool man hey this is a super cool episode uh i learned a lot i i hope you guys learned a lot. Um, thank you guys all for joining another episode of the Gym OS podcast. We're here trying to help you guys become better business owners one episode at a time. This was a super cool one. We had John Briggs in from Insight Tax, author of Profit First for Micro Gyms. If you guys haven't caught that, you might want to check it out. I'm sure it's on what, Amazon? Amazon, you bet. Yep. One of these days I'm gonna get around to writing a book. It's on my, on my to-do list. Um, super cool for you doing that. I give props. It must've taken a long time. Um, Hey, if, if these guys want to check you out or, or know, know more information about you or what you're doing, how can they find you? Um, profit first for micro gyms.com or insightstax.com. Uh, those are easy ways to find out where I am or what we're doing. All right, cool. All right, guys. So hopefully you guys learned something. If anything, um, just understand that if you don't understand the tax law, you might want to consult tax people to help you save some more money when the tax bill comes along. We are in tax season right now. So this will be especially poignant for many of you. Until next time, see you guys later. Boom, there we go. 
Another episode of the Gem OS podcast done. I know you took some good stuff from that. Like I said, I did. And that's kind of the mission here is every day we're trying to learn a little more. We're trying to become better owners a little bit more. And I'm glad you shared a little bit of time with me uh, today and, and uh, John Briggs to work on your own um, business. We all as gym owners are spending so much time in the gym trying to work on everyone's physical fitness and their movement patterns and the things that they're doing um, in their gym or out of the gym to improve their wellness. And you need to spend more time working on your own fitness. And then by fitness, I'm talking about your business fitness. So I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you like that, hey man, we're working on something new this time. We did video. So if you like that and you're watching the video, hit, hit that like button or subscribe to uh, the Push Press YouTube channel. We got all kinds of good content coming out all the time. It is our mission to put out content to help you become a better gym owner. If you're listening to this on the podcast, make sure you subscribe. Don't be a dummy. You know you need this every week. We're doing it every week, putting out new content right into your ears. So subscribe, like it, give us five stars. You know the whole deal. Help another gym owner find us. Help Apple and Spotify and them know that we're relevant and we're helping gym owners. Give us the props. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Until then, keep on grinding, guys. Yeah.